created to protect themselves, their families, and their communities from illness, hospitalization, and deaths from COVID-19. As individuals make their decisions about vaccination, Massey emphasizes the importance of providing clear and transparent information that supports informed decision-making and considers both the benefits and the risks of vaccine choices. This supports vaccine confidence in the context of rapid scientific advancement, where guidance necessarily changes as new evidence emerges. Canadians should expect to see NACI modify its guidance as new data becomes available. Our analysis considers not only vaccine efficacy, that is how vaccines work in controlled conditions of scientific studies, but also their real world effectiveness, their performance contained to, compared to other authorized and available vaccines, and the specific qualities that make a particular vaccine best suited for some populations or age groups and not for others. We also consider the feasibility of a vaccine program and apply an ethical framework in our analysis that promotes equity in the use of vaccines. It is, of course, the provincial and territorial governments that make the decision on vaccination policy in their jurisdiction and that design and deliver immunization programs. NACI's guidance supports them in making these decisions. I'm very glad that Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Chief Public Health Officer, joins us today. Dr. Henry can speak to the practical applications of NACI's advice in the context of provincial decision making. Now I will take you through NACI's updated guidance on the use of AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. AstraZeneca vaccine is authorized for use in Canada for adults 18 years of age and older. Health Canada has determined that it is safe and effective. In turn, in our updated NACI statement, NACI provides update advice on how to best to use this vaccine, considering the portfolio of COVID-19 vaccines authorized and available for use in Canada to achieve the greatest public health benefits in response to a rare but serious blood clotting condition being referred to as vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or VIT. Recall that on March 29th, NACI recommended an immediate pause in the use of AstraZeneca vaccine in those under 55 years of age following reports of VIT in Europe. NACI made this recommendation out of an abundance of caution, while Health Canada and other global regulators investigated the association of VIT with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Provincial and Territorial Chief Medical Officers of Health unanimously supported this recommendation. On April 14th, Health Canada released their safety assessment concluding that very rare events of blood clots with low platelet levels following immunization with the AstraZeneca vaccine may be linked to the vaccine. Health Canada has reaffirmed that the benefits of the AstraZeneca vaccine outweighs the risk. Using the European and Health Canada's safety assessment and reviewing the most up-to-date domestic and international evidence and guidance on VIT, NACI weighed the benefits of AstraZeneca vaccine in protecting populations against serious complication of COVID-19 and saving lives against the risk of developing VIT. We assessed the risk of developing and dying from VIT compared to COVID-19 ICU admissions and deaths that could be prevented by receiving an early dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. NACI's updated recommendations are also informed by Canada's rapidly changing COVID-19 epidemiology, including the circulation of variants of concern and hotspot areas, and a comprehensive analysis of ethics, equity, feasibility, and accessibility. Our analysis provides a framework that can be used by provinces and territories to assess the benefit risk scenarios relative relevant to their circumstances. The public health benefit risk analysis for the use of AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine may vary between jurisdictions depending on their local COVID-19 epidemiology, their local vaccine supply and logistics, and equity and acceptability considerations. In addition, these considerations may change over time. NACI continues to preferentially recommend authorized mRNA COVID-19 vaccines due to the excellent protection they provide, the absence of a safety signal of concern, and the acceptability of the vaccines by people in Canada. 
Nasi notes that Canada has procured and is expecting enough mRNA vaccines to fully vaccinate the currently eligible Canadian population before the fall of 2021. At this time, and based on current evidence, Nasi recommends that the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine may be offered to individuals 30 years of age and older without contraindications if the individual does not wish to wait for an mRNA vaccine and the benefits outweigh the risk. Nasi considered the timing of expected access to COVID-19 mRNA vaccines in our calculations because mRNA vaccines are an alternative to the AstraZeneca vaccine and the available availability of mRNA vaccines is growing. Vaccine supply should be considered by jurisdictions as they plan their immunization programs. Based on NACI's initial technical briefings to provinces and territories, jurisdictions have already begun to announce their intentions regarding the use of AstraZeneca vaccine, reflecting the, reflecting the pressing epidemiologic con conditions within these jurisdictions. While VIT is a rare but very serious adverse event, COVID-19 is causing hospitalizations and deaths across Canada, and some jurisdictions, unfortunately, are experiencing devastating rates of illness and hospitalization, straining their capacity. In this context, balancing risks and benefits is absolutely essential to the public health response. This will not be the same in every jurisdiction. In closing, I would like to emphasize that NASA continues to analyze the data as it becomes available and continues to closely monitor the scientific evidence on VIT. We will update our guidance as new evidence becomes available. Thank you. Alors, euh, je vais prendre la parole, je vais le faire cette fois-ci well. en français. Donc, bon après-midi à tous. French, le Dr. Dix et moi sommes heureux de vous présenter la déclaration en matière de santé publique mise à jour du Comité consultatif national de l'immunisation sur l'utilisation du vaccin contre la COVID d'AstraZeneca Comme vous le savez, nous avions l'intention de publier cette déclaration mardi le 20 avril. Toutefois, mardi à midi, le CNI a reçu de nouvelles données provinciales et fournissait plus de détails sur les risques de la COVID-19 dans le contexte des variants antioxydants et des zones à haute incidence. Nous avons donc décidé de retarder la publication de notre mise à jour pour nous assurer que les recommandations et que l'évaluation bénéficient de l'utilisation du vaccin d'AstraZeneca reflète l'épidémie de l'activité de la COVID-19 présentement en cours au Canada. Nature le délai n'est aucunement attribuable à nos préoccupations de l'équité supplémentaire concernant le vaccin AstraZeneca. La plupart d'entre vous savaient déjà que le CCMI est un comité d'experts indépendants. Il y a depuis de nombreux décennies donné des conseils à l'Agence de la santé publique du Canada sur l'utilisation optimale des vaccins autorisés au Canada. La vaccination contre la COVID-19 est fondamentale pour mettre fin à la pandémie et le CCMI encourage tous les Canadiens à And NACI encourages all Canadians to be vaccinated to protect themselves, protect their families and their communities against illness, hospitalization, and pendant que les gens prennent des décisions sur la vaccination, le CCNI souligne l'importance de fournir des renseignements clairs et transparents et soutient la prise de décision éclairée et qui sous-pèse les bénéfices et les différentes informations de la vaccination. Cela permet de renforcer la confiance dans l'utilisation des vaccins dans un contexte où les données probantes changent sans cesse, entraînant par le fait même que les modifications dans les recommandations. Les Canadiens devraient s'attendre à ce que le CCNI modifie ses déclarations au fur et à mesure que de nouvelles données de As new data becomes available. Notre évaluation ne considère non seulement l'efficacité potentielle du vaccin, mais elle tient aussi compte de la façon dont les vaccins fonctionnent, dans les conditions scientifiques, et considère aussi l'efficacité de la scientifique et de la performance par rapport à d'autres vaccins autorisés disponibles contre la COVID-19. Relevant to vaccination, how they work to counter COVID-19, and the specific effects of vaccinations, why they may work better for certain populations or groups. We also consider how applicable vaccination is, and we apply ethical standards to support 
fairness Bien entendu, in vaccine ce sont les gouvernements distribution and use. Of course, provincial and territorial governments are the ones making the final decisions about vaccination on their territories and to draw up and apply vaccination programs. NACI supports them in this regard. I'm very happy that Dr. Bonnie Henry, the provincial health officer of BC, is with us here today. She can explain to us the practical applications of NACI's recent update for provincial decision-making. I will now go over NACI's evidential summary update for the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. The AstraZeneca vaccine is authorized to use in Canada for Canadian adults 18 years and over. We have established that it is the safe and effective vaccine. However, we do have advice about the best use of the vaccination within the context of the use of all vaccines now authorized for use in Canada in order to ensure that we get the best benefit possible for the population given a rare but severe adverse effect called vaccine-induced from Botic immune thrombocytopenia called VIPIT or sometimes VIT. You will recommend that recently we recommended immediate pausing of the use of AstraZeneca in all individuals less than 55 years of age in Canada since adverse effects were reported where though they were. And this recommendation was made given our wish to be extremely careful given the rare but possible association of the adverse effect with the use of AstraZeneca. And provincial health officers supported this decision. Health Canada then published its evaluation of the safety profile of AstraZeneca and concluded that the very rare association of this BIT adverse effect following administration of AstraZeneca could be linked to the AstraZeneca vaccination itself, but once again stated that the benefit the risks. De Santé Canada. Et Following en Health Canada's evaluation and based on more recent scientific, scientific evidence, as well as data provided by Canadian and international, and international health services, we have decided that it is important to protect the, the risk population from COVID-19 and really weigh that against the risks of developing the adverse effect BIT. So we reevaluated the data, keeping in mind the deaths that could be prevented if one receives an early dose of AstraZeneca. Our data is also based on the ongoing and rapid evaluation of data on the spread of COVID-19, the uh, variants of concern, as well as ethics, availability and availability of vaccination. So our analysis is a framework that can be used by provinces and territories to better evaluate the scenarios and the risks in their situations. The benefit risk evaluation provided regarded AstraZeneca can vary from region to region depending on the local epidemiological disease, the availability of local supply and logistics in those provinces and territories as well as matters of acceptability. And these can evolve over time. NACI recommends using mostly mRNA vaccines given the excellent protection they provide and the absence of adverse effects and their acceptability by Canadians. NACI underscores that Canada has a sufficient supply of mRNA vaccines to vaccinate all Canadians now eligible within a short period of time, in within 2021, and suggests that AstraZeneca be offered to persons 30 years of age and older with no counterindications if the person doesn't want to wait to receive an M. RNA vaccine and the risks, the advantages outweigh the risks. And we have taken into account the support that we have from vaccine access, given that Canada has access to other vaccines, alternative vaccines, and that we are getting more and more mRNA vaccines shipped now. We, provinces and territories must take these shipments into account as they draw up their plans. Over to Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you very much and uh, good morning or good afternoon to you. And it is my uh, pleasure to be speaking to you today from the traditional and 
unceded territories of the Lekongan speaking peoples here in Victoria, British Columbia, now known as the Esquimalt and the Songhees First Nations. And I'm very grateful to be able to talk to you from these lands. I'm Dr. Bonnie Henry, British Columbia's Provincial Health Officer. And I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Howard Mew, who's the Deputy Chief Public Health Officer at the Public Health Agency of Canada. And we're here on behalf of the Council of Chief Medical Officers of Health, who are our counterparts across the provinces and territories. In many jurisdictions, we are, as you know, seeing a rapid rise in COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations in this third and most alarming uh, phase of the pandemic that we have seen. To combat this, we need to use every tool at our disposal, including all of the vaccines that are authorized by Health Canada, along with the public health measures that we know uh, needed to continue to be essential to individual and community protection across the country. As you know, in February, Health Canada authorized the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines as safe and effective for use in Canada in adults over the age of 18. As Chief Medical Officers of Health, we have been closely following evidence over the last few weeks of the international reports of this rare but serious blood clotting condition following the use of AstraZeneca vaccine, referred to, as you know, as uh, vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or more easily known as BIT. Our public health advice on these rare events is informed by Health Canada Safety Review, by clinical research, and um, by the important work done by the National Advisory Committee on Immunization and the uh, risk-benefit analysis that they have provided. As Canada's Chief Med Medical Officers of Health, we are very grateful to NASI for their hard work, and we know it has been a lot of uh, work over the last few weeks particularly, for providing this framework for assessing COVID-19 exposure risk in order to determine the epidemiologic conditions under which each age group are most likely to benefit from this vaccine. NASI has lowered their recommendations around the age threshold and provided considerations that we will use to inform provincial, territorial, and regional public health decisions on how to best use this vaccine in our programs across the country. Given some areas of Canada are experiencing very high levels of COVID-19 with increasing pressure on our hospitals and of course, the resultant deaths. There is the potential for surges and outbreaks as well driven by COVID-19 variants of concern across the country. NASI advises jurisdictions to adjust the age threshold for use of AstraZeneca vaccine based on this local epidemiology. The optimal use of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine in our immunization programs across the country will also vary based on current and expected vaccine supply and the logistical considerations that we are faced with. Our overall goal continues to be focused on enabling as many people as possible to be immunized as quickly as possible against COVID-19 with a safe and effective vaccine while ensuring that the highest risk populations are prioritized. All of Canada's approved vaccines provide a high level of protection against COVID-19, and we have seen that in countries around the world. Through earlier access to vaccination, we have the opportunity to vaccinate more people faster, which protects our health care system right now, reduces severe illness on a personal level, as well as in a community level, and saves lives. Of course, we remain committed to providing information to support every individual in making informed decisions on their vaccination choice. As medical health officers of health, we take vaccine safety extremely seriously and continue to make a priority in the careful design of our advice and vaccine program. Health Canada, the Public Health Agency of Canada, NACI, and the Council of Chief Medical Officers of Health will continue to work together to examine and assess any safety concerns and take appropriate action. Our guidance will continue to be grounded in the latest available evidence, and we will continue to keep everyone in Canada informed. Thank you. And I'll now turn it over to uh, Dr. New. Thank you, Bonnie. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je suis Dr. Howard Hello, New, sous-administrateur en chef de la Santé Public Health Officer du Canada, accompagné de ma collègue. 
Dr. Bonnie Henry, médecin hygiéniste provincial de la Colombie-Britannique. Nous sommes ici au nom du Conseil des médecins hygiénistes en chef du Canada. Nous constatons présentement dans plusieurs régions une augmentation rapide du nombre de cas de COVID-19 et d'hospitalisation attribuable à la troisième et plus menaçante vague de la pandémie. Afin de lutter contre cette vague, nous devons utiliser tous les outils à notre disposition y compris tous les vaccins autorisés par Santé Canada. Nous devons également continuer de respecter les mesures de santé publique qui demeurent essentielles pour protéger les personnes et les collectivités. Comme vous le savez, Santé Canada a autorisé en février le vaccin AstraZeneca pour son inocuité et son efficacité chez les adultes au Canada. En tant que médecin hygiéniste en chef, nous avons suivi de près au cours des dernières semaines, les rapports internationaux faisant état de manifestations rares et sérieuses de cas sanguins suivant l'administration de vaccins AstraZeneca. Ces manifestations sont désignées par le terme de thrombocytopénie immunitaire thrombotique induite par le vaccin ou TIL. Nos conseils de santé publique au sujet de ces manifestations cliniques inhabituelles rares sont fondés sur l'examen de l'inocuité de Santé Canada, la recherche clinique et l'analyse des risques et des avantages du Comité consultatif national de l'immunisation. Ou CCNI. With the NACI, the en tant que médecin hygiéniste en chef, nous remercions la CCNI pour son travail et pour avoir fourni un cadre pour l'évaluation des risques d'exposition à la COVID-19 afin de déterminer les conditions épidémiologiques dans lesquelles certains groupes d'âge sont les plus susceptibles de bénéficier de ce vaccin. Le CCNI a abaissé le seuil d'âge et a offert des considérations qui servent à éclairer les décisions de santé publique, provinciales, territoriales et régionales sur l'utilisation optimale de ce vaccin dans les programmes de vaccination, étant donné les niveaux élevés de COVID-19 et l'augmentation du nombre d'hospitalisations et des décès qui connaissent certaines régions et étant donné le potentiel de résurgence et d'éclosion stimulé par les variants préoccupants qui existent partout au pays le CCNI recommande aux administrations d'ajuster le seuil d'âge pour l'utilisation de vaccins AstraZeneca en fonction de leur épidémiologie locale. L'utilisation optimale des vaccins AstraZeneca contre la COVID-19 dans nos programmes d'immunisation variera aussi d'une administration à l'autre en fonction de l'approvisionnement actuel et prévu en vaccins en plus des considérations logistiques. As well as logistical considerations and, of course, the demography, we would like to allow the most Canadians possible to be vaccinated against COVID-19 in the most quickly as possible to be vaccinated against COVID-19 as quickly as possible with safe and effective vaccinations while ensuring that high-risk populations are treated with safety and effective vaccinations. All vaccines contre la COVID-19 approved in Canada have a high protection level and receive prioritized access to vaccines. And access to the vaccination. Nous donne l'occasion de vacciner un plus grand nombre de personnes plus rapidement, de protéger notre système de soins de santé, de réduire les risques de maladies graves et de sauver des vies. Évidemment, nous sommes déterminés à présenter des renseignements qui permettront aux individus de prendre des décisions éclairées en matière de En tant que médecins hygiénistes en chef, nous prenons l'inocuité des vaccins We take the safety of vaccinations alors que nous very seriously. It's one of our priorities nos avis et nos programmes de and plays into our very Santé careful Canada, evidentiary updates. Public Canada, the Health CCNI Canada, et le Conseil des NACI, médecins en chef and the Chief Public Health Office continue to examine and evaluate all concerns reported toute inquiétude en matière d'inocuité et agirant en conséquence. Nos directives de nous permettent d'entrer dans les données probantes les plus récentes. Soyez assurés que nous continuerons à tenir tous les individus individuels au Canada bien informés. Et restez-vous que nous continuerons à garder tous les Canadiens bien informés. Merci beaucoup, Dr. New. Je vais maintenant ouvrir le téléphone pour les questions. Je vous remercie de rappeler une question et une follow-up. Vous pouvez poser des questions dans les deux langues. Donc, nous allons ouvrir la téléconférence aux questions. On vous rappelle que c'est une question, une question. On ouvre les questions, une question et une follow-up question, et vous pouvez mettre vos questions dans les deux officielles. Monsieur Jacob. Merci. 
please press star 1 at this time for any question. Veuillez appuyer sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. You may cancel your question at any time by pressing star 2. Vous pouvez annuler votre question à tout moment en appuyant sur les touches étoile et 2. Our first question, notre première question est de Adam Miller from CBC News. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Hi there. Um, Ontario and Alberta recently announced cases of VIT in two people in their 60s. New Brunswick had a case of a person in their 30s, and Alberta, Alberta's had a case of in someone in their 50s. So why hasn't NACI updated its guidelines to explain that the risk of these rare blood clots can be present in all of these age groups? And are you going to recommend informed consent on the risk of this with this vaccine? Thank you for that question. In the new statement, we do uh, talk about the risk of it. We um, and we have used a the same rate of developing it among all age groups. So we have considered um, equal risk across the age groups in our statement. Uh, in addition, we have indicated that people should have informed consent um, when receiving AstraZeneca vaccine. So they are aware of the potential risks of developing VIT as well as the symptoms to uh, be aware of. And should they choose to get the vaccine and have any of those symptoms, they should immediately uh, follow up with a healthcare provider. In addition, we have uh, um, notified healthcare practitioners of those symptoms as well, because importantly, um, healthcare providers need to be aware that this may occur. Thank you. Can I can I add to that? Just in, in that, as, as Dr. Deeks has said, it's um, the the risk of it we now understand is the same across all age groups. Or at least there's no reason to believe it's different, um, but. It's the risk of COVID itself that varies by age group. We know that the older you are, the more likely you, likely you are to have more severe illness. And it's the risk of, of uh, COVID that is in your community that drives um, the age that the benefit uh, varies. And with all of our vaccines, informed consent is a part of all of our immunization programs. And just making sure that people are aware of this, uh, this risk associated uh, with this vaccine. Thank you. Next question. Uh, sorry, I had a follow-up. Um, yes, yeah, follow we've heard reports that uh, we've heard reports that there may be more than four cases of VIT in Canada, but that's all that's been reported to date by the provinces. Can you confirm how many cases of VIT have occurred in Canada? And, um, you know, is there a system in place, you know, to, to get this information out quickly? Because it seems like it's really in, of interest to Canadians and the international medical community to get this out as quickly as possible to understand more about it and to potentially, you know, learn more about treatment and, and save lives, potentially. Sure, I can start. And then um, either Dr. Henry or Dr. New can follow up. There's a very robust vaccine safety surveillance system in Canada. So um, as of today, there have been four cases of confirmed VIT reported through that uh, vaccine safety surveillance system to the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, and that is how at a national level, we um, determine the number of cases that have been reported. Um, often there is a, um, you'll hear about cases that are being investigated um, of any reportable disease, including any vaccine safety issue. And they're, they're, some of those do not go on to actually be um, the condition of interest, this case fit, um, and others will, and then they, they will be reported. Uh, but given the nature of this condition, there is ongoing communication across the country by a group called the Vaccine Vigilance Working Group to ensure that uh, everybody across the country from a public health perspective is informed as soon as possible. Uh, those, that communication would also go to all of the um, CMOHs or Chief Medical Officers of Health across the country. Yes, it's a doctor, maybe just to, to, to tag on to what Dr. Deek said. Yes, uh, we have an excellent uh, 
uh, sort of national, uh, you know, and robust surveillance system uh, for 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 vaccine uh, safety. And uh, as uh, Dr. Geeks alluded to, and I think Dr. Henry will uh, will also uh, confirm, is that the very good communications. Uh, so anytime there's a a potential case, certainly within the individual provincial or territorial jurisdiction, they'll do their due diligence to investigate, to look at the. Uh, the, the results uh, do the necessary work in terms of follow up laboratory tests and so on. And once there obviously meets the criteria in terms of a confirmation of that, it's reported promptly to us here at the Public Health Agency of Canada. And then, of course, as you said, uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, going public in terms of informing Canadians. So, so that's how the system works. But certainly, the lead I think in terms of the investigation, the follow up, and the confirmation is at the provincial and territorial level. And then we at the national level at the Public Health Agency get the reports in due course. Dr. Henry? Thank you, Doctor. Sure. I, I mean, just to, to add that uh, we do contribute um, from the, the public health agency to the, the international understanding of this as well. And there are many things that cause illness when we're immunizing millions of people. Um, you expect uh, that there will be a certain number of people who have clotting disorders that may or may not be related to this. So there is an investigation of every single one. Um, to determine whether it actually meets the criteria for this or not. And I, I will also say that you know, this is one of the things that figures into the risk assessment that we do around COVID itself, because we know COVID can cause uh, blood clotting in a much higher rate than the very rare things that we're seeing with that associated with vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Henry. We'll move to the next question. Operator. Thank you. The next question, la prochaine question is to Mackenzie Gray from CTV News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi there. My question is for Dr. Deeks. Uh, in, when you announced that it was uh, AstraZeneca it could be given to people who are 30 and older, you also said, and it's a quote, if the individual does not wish to get uh, the mRNA vaccine, uh, that's a reason that they should potentially be able to wait. Dr. Henry, Dr. New, every doctor in the country has been telling Canadians the entire time to get the first vaccine that is available to them. So why are you saying that people could potentially wait to get a uh, Moderna or a Pfizer when an AstraZeneca could be available to them? What we've said is that there should be individual choice. So we've made the recommendation that um, anybody who, because of the risk of um, the very rare risk of VIT, uh, does not wish to receive that vaccine, they should be able to wait and receive a, a mRNA vaccine. Ultimately, though, NACI just makes recommendations. So the, the policy, the vaccine policies um, throughout the country are decided by the provinces and territories. Um, but that is what we have said within our statement. Just saying, Dr. Quash, if you have anything to add to that. I mean, I think you've uh, captured it very well, Shelley. I think the bottom line is a like everything, risk-benefit analysis. So we do agree that what we want is to vaccinate Canadians as quickly as possible. However, if you are in an area where there is no COVID transmission, if you have no um, contact with the outside or if you're able to shelter through public health measures, then there is a possibility to wait for the mRNA vaccine. I think that what was intended was to say, if somebody decides not to take the AstraZeneca for some reason, that person should not be put at the end of the list of the mRNA because of their, in terms of their priority. So priority remains priority, but if you do want to get a vaccine earlier, I think the AstraZeneca is a safe way to, to get to be protected. Thank you. But I just, I just don't understand why there's any conversation about potentially waiting. Like, just to go back, I, Dr. Henry and Dr. New, I'd like to hear your opinion on this as well. Every public health official in this country has been begging people to get vaccinated as soon as they can. So why is NACI even introducing into a conversation about potentially waiting to pick and choose a vaccine? This is precisely what Dr. Tam and Dr. New tell us every day that we should not be doing. Yeah, no, I understand. I think that what is being said here is that depending on where you are in your in the priority list, you know, if you're 60 and over, next week you, you could be able to get this 
um, mRNA vaccine. So it's just a matter when we made this risk benefit analysis, we took into account the time one would have to wait to get the mRNA vaccine. The UK used a four month wait. We used we were in terms of weeks between one and seven weeks, depending on where you were on the priority list. So that is just, you know, we are being fully transparent, explaining exactly how we made our recommendation. And that is what that what that was the basis for our um, thinking through this uh, question. Thank you. I'll just add to that, that you're absolutely right. Um, the basis of all of our programs in this country are the uh, particularly Pfizer, because that's the vaccine that we have the most of, and uh, the Moderna vaccines. And we have the added benefit of having AstraZeneca and hopefully soon the J&J &J vaccine too. And we are targeting those in most of the country to different areas, particularly hotspot areas. And because most of our programs are based on age, there are some people that are not yet el eligible for the main part of the program. And the AstraZeneca is an important vaccine for us to have available, especially right now, because it protects people really well from hospitalization, from ICU, and it protects your community too. So we are still, um, and my counterparts across the country, when we're in this uh, phase that we are in right now, having whatever vaccine is available to you, and we would encourage you to take that. They are all safe and effective vaccines, and we've seen real world effectiveness of, of both of the, or all three of the vaccines that are available right now in Canada. We do um, recognize that some people uh, will not want uh, or will not be able to uh, take the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, and they may choose to wait if they can protect themselves using public health measures. But absolutely, I encourage people to get the vaccine that is avail available to them first. And I can tell you members of my family have received AstraZeneca vaccine on my recommendation recently. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to the next question. Prochaine question, operator. Thank you. The next question, la prochaine question is Lauren Pelly from CBC News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi there. I know that you are obviously just recommending uh, these, these changes to who can access the AstraZeneca vaccine, but I am wondering if you have any insight, you know, these rare serious blood clots that are occurring. Um, how are they treated now? Have we made any progress understanding them? Can you just share a little bit on, you know, these rare cases, as more Canadians may be getting these shots, we may see more. Do you feel that we are prepared to handle these rare instances when they happen? Carolyn, over to you for that one. Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly who is best placed to answer this because we are really looking at the vaccine and not the treatment. Um, the best people are, of course, your hematologist specialized in thrombosis. From my understanding, being a pediatric infectious disease specialist, not an adult one, so not seeing that many clots in general, um, this, the, in terms of treatment, when we use IVIG and non-heparin, um, anticoagulants, the outcome seems to be better. However, you know, as you said, we're going to see more and more. I think that as we pick up those cases earlier, the outcome will be better. Um, and as and healthcare workers become more acquainted with this um, ATL, with this entity, the treatment used is going to be also better um, targeted to that because, you know, a, a regular clot would be treated with heparin, and if you have very, very low platelets and at risk of bleeding, you would transfuse platelets. But it's very possible that in this particular case, these treatment would just worsen the condition. So I think that that's why um, making sure that our healthcare workers are absolutely knowledgeable about this entity is key to have better outcomes post treatment. But in terms of, you know, latest. Uh, treatment uh, discoveries for the VIT, I could not say more. Thank you. I will just say, to, to echo what Karen did say, um, this has been another part of what we need to do to make sure that we're prepared for this. So we're putting out messages to people about what to look for, what the time frame is, and what the signs and symptoms are so that they can get assessed and treated early. And we have a um, good information that's coming out from the public health agency around that as well. 
uh, we have a network of clinicians across the country with a key uh, clinician in each province and territory who is working together to be able to uh, support um, family docs. So it's a hematologist, somebody who's used to dealing with the blood disorders, uh, where this phenomenon has been seen from other things. We call it uh, either autoimmune induced or heparin induced um, blood uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia. Um, so it's not an unknown entity. Um, it is not a common entity that we see in public health or in infectious disease, but it is something the hematologists are quite familiar with. So having that network of clinicians to support the family doctors or the eMERGE doctors who are assessing people is really important too. But we must remember that this is rare. Um, so uh, that's why having some people, key people that anybody can talk to, any clinician can talk to if they're concerned about this condition in a patient is important. Yes, and it's Dr. Numero, I just ran out the answer uh, with my two colleagues. You're right. Uh, certainly uh, myself as well, I'm not a hematologist. Uh, if I do anything clinically, it's more in the world of adult tuberculosis. So uh, similar to Dr. Quash, I wouldn't be able to tell you about the latest treatments, but as a uh, Dr. Henry also alluded to uh, certainly the role of the Public Health Agency of Canada. We're sort of a facilitator convener. So we've been uh, making the connections, recognizing there's a, a well-established group. I, I call it a community practice among the hematologists, the, the specialists, the clinicians uh, in terms of exchanging best practices, what they're learning from each other, learning from the international colleagues. So anything we can do to help support that in terms of making sure that the right information on the latest treatments uh, is disseminated. And also, not that everyone has to know that, but at least in terms of at least the connections between, as Dr. Henry said, be it family uh, physicians on the front line, being able to connect to a specialist or hematologist who would then have that information based on uh, their exchanges with uh, their community of practice. I think that's that's the way we're, we're obviously making sure that uh, uh, Canadians can be sure that uh, the treatments are available and accessible uh, throughout the country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Any follow up? I also thank you for, for all of those answers, by the way. Um, I just want to check as well how closely you are following the Johnson & Johnson concerns south of the border. Uh, since, you know, fairly soon we will have two vaccines being used in Canada that are both being linked to these rare blood clots. So just anything you can share on what you're looking ahead to now. Stop. Turn you. Maybe I'll start first because I think that the process uh, it's uh, sort of repeated itself a few times. So that's good though. Certainly, uh, I can't speak uh, to, for Health Canada, but uh, also being another quote a federal department, but independent as, as a regulator. I know that they're in close contact uh, with their counterparts in the U.S. as, as well as uh, international regulators, uh, looking at the latest data, the safety signal, uh, seeing what uh, what the data is in, in terms of the safety signal and so on. And once uh, uh, they have all that, they'll obviously. Uh, do their own analysis and come forward with uh, the results of their safety review. Then in turn, NASI, I know is, is chomping at the bit, as they say to uh, obviously get that information, uh, the results of the analysis, the safety review from Health Canada as part of their deliberations in terms of any uh, recommendations they would develop uh, uh, with respect to the use of, of that vaccine here in Canada. And then of course, at the end of, end of all that, uh, looking at Dr. Henry, it's uh, provinces and territories that take that all into account, you know, all have seen uh, what Health Canada has pronounced on, on the, the safety uh, you know, and effic uh, efficacy of the, the Janssen vaccine, also what the NACI uh, will be coming forward with uh, in terms of any uh, recommendations, and then obviously uh, having to take into account their uh, local epidemiology, uh, other contexts, other considerations will obviously operationalize it to uh, uh, their best advantage. The only thing I'd add to Dr. New's comment is that the equivalent um, advisory committee in the U.S. is called ACIP, and NACI has close ties with ACIP. So as uh, similar to NACI having meetings about vaccines in Canada, they're having ongoing meetings. So um, we are able to benefit from uh, their meetings and hearing from uh, them about some of the decisions they've made. So we will be looking at the um, regulatory um, safety conclusions, but also link in with ACIP. You thing, know, this, sorry. Can I just say that it, it, it also um, uh, is, as we are looking for this, the safety signal showed up in Europe with this vaccine, but we are looking at it with all vaccines. and. Uh, I think we, there is a very low level that has been seen associated with a number of different vaccines. Um, and really importantly, 
we have a very uh, much higher rate of similar clotting disorders that we see with infection with COVID-19. So all of that figures into the, the balance as well. And I know, as uh, Dr. Dietz was saying, ASIP is looking at uh, J&J uh, today even. So we'll expect to have more information from Nasi soon. Thank you. I think the end of that response uh, cut off a little bit. Uh, we can move back over to the next question. Question question, operator. Thank you. The next question, la prochaine question est de Stephanie Taylor from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Hi, this question uh, is for Dr. Dietz, uh, Dr. Dietz or Dr. Or Carolyn as well. Are you looking at making any changes to how NASI provides advice, given that it was not able to provide advice uh, quickly to provinces, and provinces may, had to make a decision on their own as to how to use AstraZeneca vaccine in people younger than 55, given uh, the spread we see currently? So does that give NASI any pause to rethink its processes or how would it administers advice when it comes to vaccines? Sure, why don't I start? And then it'd probably be good to hear from Dr. Henry as well, because you received some of the information. Um, so uh, NASI has been having uh, multiple meetings on various, uh, various uh, changes that have happened with the with a number of the products. Um, but we also want to ensure that our any of our statements that we release are evidence based and very thorough. Um, notwithstanding that, we are often on the agenda of the of the meetings that the Special Advisory Committee or SAC that uh, that is composed of all the CCMOHs across the country and provide regular updates to um, the provinces and territories about where we are. So we do that informally on the on the various agendas um, and had done that throughout this period. Um, we had done that as has as did Health Canada. So the CMOHs did not need to wait till a formal NACI statement was out. What happened at, um, last week was, or this week, it just seems like it's been a long <laughs> last week. Um, we had certain information based on Canadian surveillance data, but then got um, more detailed information that was um, from, from a particular province that had more detailed information about, and more current information about um, ICU admissions. So we were able to do a um, more fulsome analysis on um, Monday night. Uh, and so that is why we, we presented to SAC on Sunday. They heard where we were heading. And then Monday got additional data. And um, that actually changed the risk benefit because this data looked more at some of the serious outcomes um, using the variants of concern. And so um, we felt it was more important to use more, um, more fulsome data and in the risk benefit analysis. And then that would be of more use to the provinces and territories than to rush out, make a statement, and then continue the analysis and change the statement. And um, I, I can add as well. So uh, uh, Matthew Chin is executive secretary to, to the National Advisory Committee. So I work with the Public Health Agency of Canada, and I would just note that you know, we convene the committee um, really as needed, as evidence evolves. And in the case of the last week, I mean, NASI convened um, three or four times within a very short span as this information was evolving and continued to evolve. So the committee is absolutely reactive and responsive to information that's evolving. We've been seeing throughout this pandemic that every day brings um, a, a new surprise both in terms of the COVID epidemiology, in terms of what we're seeing in the, the, red, the rate of this um, rare but serious adverse event. And uh, so we're, we're really trying to 
make sure that the committee has the ability to be responsive and reactive to the evolving situation and find where those appropriate junctures are to brief the provinces and territories on the direction of those, of those recommendations and then um, to brief the public as soon as possible once the committee finalizes their deliberations. Um, yeah, I'm happy to turn to Dr. Henry if she has any additional thoughts on um, that relationship between the committee who gives it advice to the agency, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and then we make that available to the provinces and territories. Yeah, as, uh, as Shalia said, you, you know, and, and Carolyn, we meet regularly and we feed questions that we have back into the NASI to address. And I think it, it, I can speak for all of my colleagues to say that we have tremendous um, confidence and respect for the work that NASI does, but it is sometimes we have to make decisions based on what's happening in the provinces and territories on a rapid basis. So we use what we can, um, everything that we know from uh, the interactions and the ongoing deliberations and updates from Health Canada, uh, from what we learn from other countries. Uh, we had meetings over this past weekend with a number of other countries as well, as well as with uh, with NASI. So sometimes it does seem like we need to get out ahead based on, on the urgent uh, changes that are happening in our provinces and territories. But we do use the, the recommendations from the National Advisory Committee to underpin uh, the work that we're doing. And it, it's a challenge. It's a really difficult uh, period of time. And we need vaccines right now. Uh, we know that. We know that these vaccines, all of them, protect people and keep people safe and, and uh, prevent transmission and uh, keep people out of hospitals. And as our hospitals have been more and more stretched in these past few weeks, it has meant that we've had to take decisions um, based on the best information that we have on an ongoing basis. So the frameworks that uh, come out of the National Advisory Committee, particularly around this specific issue, have been ones that uh, have been very helpful for us. And then we need to make those decisions about how does that translate into the situation we're dealing with on the ground today. Um, so uh, it, it is a very um, important relationship that we have with the National Advisory Committee and with Health Canada and to understand things as we move on. Yeah. And maybe if I may just to set the, the timeline straight, the um, report from Health Canada came out on April 14th. Um, NASI made its recommendation to the Public Health Agency of Canada over the weekend, gave that recommendation to the provinces on Sunday, which then helped the provinces make their decision based on their local epidemiology. One has to realize that once the recommendation is finalized at the NASI level, we'll still need to have it translated because Canada has two official languages. And we need to also web code that because um, we cannot post anything on the Government of Canada's um, web system without having it be um, available um, to uh, um, visually impaired. So that adds on to the complexity. We understand that it would be very um, mu much better if we could get that publicly available before. But in terms of reactiveness and turnaround time, um, I think that three days is actually the best that a committee can do to meet consensus because this is what we're aiming for is a consensus of committee members. It's not an executive decision. It's really based on data and on everyone agreeing on a recommendation. Thank you. Thanks. For a follow-up question, when can we expect NASI recommendations on how the Johnson & Johnson vaccine can be used, given the fact that we have about 300,000 doses arriving towards the end of next week, soon to be distributed to provinces and territories? Yeah, I'll take that one if you don't mind. So that recommendation has been ready for a while. The reason why we have decided to wait was because of the, the signal that is currently um, being investigated in the US. So since ACIP is meeting today to decide what to do with this, the last thing we want is to put a recommendation out too early to have to change it again. You'll remember what happened with AstraZeneca at the beginning. Um, you guys all told us, why didn't you not wait to see the other data before putting out your recommendation? Because we wanted to be so quick and nimble that we put out a recommendation as quickly as we could. So see, we try to learn from our previous mishaps, and this time around saying that we wouldn't have the um, Johnson uh, product in use before early May. We still have two weeks to 
wait on new data to be able to put out the most up-to-date version as possible. As you, as you know, as we said, we need to be very flexible. Data are moving daily um, and we never know exactly what's coming ahead of us. But when we know, we try to be um, cognizant of them to really give you the best recommendation we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kors. We have time for one more question. One last question, Operator. Thank you, merci. The next question, la prochaine question est de Christine Barak from CBC National News. Please go ahead, la parole est à vous. Hi there, thanks for taking my question. Um, I understand that NACI's guidance is for the provinces and territories based on local epidemiology, but I just want to know how should the average Canadian decide whether they should be waiting for an mRNA vaccine or not? I can start with I can start with this. Um, each each everybody um, knows and and feels risk and risk benefit very differently. Um, and so and each of the provinces and territories have slightly different vaccine rollouts. So depending on where you are, um, you I'm I'm in Nova Scotia. I know when I will be eligible for a vaccine. Um, and I also know in my, in my situation, um, how my, my own risk benefit. So um, people will, will need to look at um, how, how worried they are about COVID, how much COVID there is in the community, um, whether there's a vaccine available to, to them now and if they want to get vaccinated now, um, how much they are worried about adverse events, because we all are worried about that in a slightly different way. Um, and then they'll need to make a decision um, one way or the, uh, another about where that risk benefit lies for them about receiving um, a vaccine now or, or waiting um, for a vaccine later. I think uh, we're all very, all of the, the panel is very passionate about, about vaccines and we all um, know how important it is for Canadians to get vaccinated, as many Canadians as possible, to be vaccinated um, as soon as possible. But risk perception and risk tolerance is actually a very individual thing. Thanks. And I would just add that um, I can say unequivocally in, in unequivocally in British Columbia, in most places in British Columbia, especially in areas where we have a lot of transmission right now of this virus, take the vaccine that is offered to you. And they are safe, they are effective, they work, it will protect you, it will protect your family. And uh, my colleagues across the country who are dealing with what we're dealing with right now would say the same thing. Thank right, you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Sorry, go ahead with your follow up. Question for one of my colleagues. Ontario is now uh, prioritizing pregnant women for COVID vaccines based on evidence of severe outcomes. Is that the updating advice on that front as well? Um, yes, we are looking at that uh, currently and uh, are meeting on that next week. So, yes, we're looking at it. Thank you. Um, that will be all for today's press conference. This is Kimmy Fayon, we'll briefing the Gink Rouge of Zip. Pass a journey. Au revoir. Thank you. Merci.